am so pleased to have fellow alumni Matt Christensen with us today. Matt is a teacher at Blue Valley Northwest High School in Overland Park, Kansas. He was diagnosed with, as dyslexic when he was in elementary school and describes himself as a parent, a teacher, a learning disabilities advocate, and a motivational speaker. So welcome back to campus. We're thrilled to have you here, Matt. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. For those of us that are unfamiliar with your, with your background, would you talk about your, your background and your journey into teaching? Both sides of my family have a long history of being teachers, so it was a profession that was something on my mind all the time. Uh, I grew up in a small rural town in Iowa, and in growing up in that small town, it was uh, I was a uh, guy who was passionate about learning because my parents were both highly educated. My mom's a teacher. She's been a teacher forever. She just kind of uses that teacher quality. Um, she got her undergraduate and uh, master's deg degrees and uses those to help her teach. And my father, who's a veterinarian, went on to get his doctor degree and so growing up in a family like that where education is so important and so part of who they are it was a neat childhood but when I went to school I found that that passion I had for learning ran into conflict because I just wasn't succeeding at the rate of other kids um, I was struggling with my spelling tests I wasn't able to receive the sticker that they all received and those really important things for a kid at early stages weren't happening for me and so in the end of first grade uh, I was tested for a learning disability and they found out that I was dyslexic identified as being dyslexic and that started a whole journey about how to be a successful dyslexic individual that led me into teaching and today um, helps me, I believe, teach students in new ways. My background is in children's literature and so I love Patricia Polacco and she has a book that focuses on her journey as a dyslexic child. I don't know if you've had to, a chance to read Thank You Mr. Falker, but you have, you have homework now. Okay, you, can, you. You, can, you can read that. <laughs> In that book, she describes some of her experiences as a dyslexic child. Describe some of yours. It's an interesting scenario because you, I think most students with learning disabilities know in the heart of hearts that they're very, they know that they're smart, they know that they're capable, they want to learn, they like learning. The challenge is the way that they're asked to learn sometimes doesn't match how they learn or what they know. And so it's, you feel an angst sometimes because you really, really want to show how much you can do and what you know, but the learning disability, whatever it is for them, holds them back. And it's uh, that challenge of wanting to be good and wanting someone to recognize that and then be a rewarded or appreciated for that that I think creates the biggest struggle. Mm -hmm. So what were ways that you could show you were capable and smart and learning? Well, I was lucky. My parents realized that school would be a struggle. So they realized that maybe there was an opportunity for me to do things outside of school that where I could still learn and grow and participate and, and experience a new world. So I was highly involved in 4-H um, and there I worked in um, leadership and public speaking and citizenship and entomology and rocketry and <laughs> that style of learning where it was relaxed and casual but allowed me to develop a peer group because in school I was oftentimes seen as my peers as the one who failed tests and the one who may not be as bright but it gave me an opportunity then to work with other groups of people who or in that setting, I was really successful. And that was really important to me because it gave me uh, kind of an anchor in education and in peers that kind of helped me believe I could succeed. I understand you had a real challenge with your locker. Well, being dyslexic is the challenge because you have that reversal somewhere inside your brain that causes you to, to make that reversal. And um, classically defined dyslexia typically involves reading and writing. Uh, and dysnomic is the reversal of numbers. So I'm both. So the challenge of a locker is turning it left or right, and people often say, well, it's your left hand. Well, it doesn't work for me. And then the, the common locker combination, 55, 34, it just seems to mesh together. So, you know, the simplest things became the most important to me. The smallest <laughs> things made me feel different um, because while I did feel different in my learning, it was also a challenge because where do you go if you can't put your things in your locker? Uh, how do you participate like a normal kid? And one of the things I think I felt and a lot of my peers who have talked to me since then about being in school and being learning disabled was you don't want to feel different. You want to be appreciated for who you are, but not being able to be in your locker makes you clearly different than everybody else. So you became the kid with the massive book bag that struggled down the hall and you lost things or didn't have as um, control of the things you needed. And those are some of the signs I think that today we can see as teachers to say, oh, something, something's there. So let's figure out what, let's move towards what that is. And while I don't think myself or some classroom teachers are trained to really be able to identify that's not our job. Those early signs of being able to help alert people that could, this is a kid who could really receive services. And if that happens early, I think sped kids who are maybe missed 
and then receive those services early rather than waiting later, accomplish so much more and have such an easier time sometimes. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's better. Right. They can learn some strategies that might help them organize in ways other than yeah. with a locker. That's yeah. the huge piece is the strategy piece because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times I see SPED classrooms where um, they're just doing homework or they're just, um, they take them to a regular classroom and they struggle and it's kind of a, a triage kind of deal. They pull them out and helicopter them out to a new place and get them in this bedroom to help them catch mm -hmm. back up. But when you have an effective classroom that helps teach those strategies of how to take notes and how to read and how to, and that's a challenge sometimes as a teacher to figure out which strategies will work and it takes mm -hmm. trial and error. But when you empower a child to know how they learn and who they are, you give them so much more than content and they make pick up content so fast. And I've seen kids who sometimes weren't, were able to make huge gains very quickly because of a, one or two strategies, but that strategy has to be mirrored with the content as well. And if that happens, it's so neat yeah. to see that. That's why we right. do it, that passion right. of a kid right. of like, that was right. great. That, that was impact, yeah. yes, it's fun. absolutely. So you describe yourself as a parent. So talk about um, how challenges can bleed over at home and uh, message to parents. Well, it's, it's tough being a, a parent of a learning disabled child. My child was just identified as being learning disabled. Um, we just went through the process and it's a long, intense process mm -hmm. uh, of multiple trips. And it's a scary thing being a SPED parent because there's not a lot of resources sometimes in the community. You're not sure who to ask. Um, what are your rights as a parent for a 504 or an IEP or how do I do the process? And there's not sometimes those organizations who will step in right away and help you. And the school is trying to do all they can, but it's difficult for them to provide as much education for you as they're doing everything else. And um, you know, the, Working with a child who has sped, you oftentimes don't see what happens in the home, but I kind of associate it and using my talks, that idea of a mobile. So if you pull on one part of the mobile, the rest of the characters all move and struggle. And that's kind of what happens in a house of a child with a learning disability. The attention needs to be paid to them, the struggle of doing that. And that can set up a different dynamic between siblings or a different dynamic between parents. And I think it puts a lot of stress on the relationship. And the reason I think my parents did such a great job, and I think I've been successful, is you know, they never lost track of the fact that it, at the end of the day, when you come home, it's all about loving each other and caring for each other. And no matter how many questions you did that night of your homework or how many math problems you're supposed to do, the ultimate goal is to have some fun and relax. And you come out of this classroom so challenged and stressed out, and you sometimes demonstrate behaviors that don't look like normal behaviors because you're trying to get that energy out. Then when you come home, they let me play in the yard or um, run around for a while before we did it. And they oftentimes limited the amount of questions I did or set new goals for me based on what that had happened so that I could be successful. And we having now my son identified, realized that sometimes his behaviors are not typical of other kids, but that's representative of his challenge and his stress. And I believe from my experience that every SPED kid is given some gift. And if we as educators or we as parents can help work towards figuring that out. Um, I believe all people want to know what they're great at, and I think all people want to be recognized for it, and they want to work towards mastery. And I think if a parent and a teacher and a school administrator can all work together, or a psych or a social, whatever it is, and work together to help that happen, it's an amazing thing for a child. Absolutely, so good advice. Love your child, provide opportunities for them to do things that they enjoy and that they are good at. Yep, yeah. and, and acknowledge it, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Um, you tried um, some different things in school, um, music, sports. Talk about those and your success and what you'd like coaches to know. <laughs> well, it's always, you know, my dyslexia affects me in a classroom, on a field, mm -hmm. in, in band. Mm -hmm. Wherever I was, it affected me. And so um, I oftentimes had to be accepting of playing a lowering instrument or doing a less involved activity because um, playing music was difficult to see the the notes on the page and not make a mistake, but I, there's no greater experience for me than making music with a group of people. Mm -hmm. And today, I think having been in the band, even if I was, I played triangle on my freshman year, <laughs> I was a cymbal player in my junior year, I played bass drum in my senior year, but the chance to have that chance to make music enriched my life. Like, I listen to music differently now because mm -hmm. I've had a chance to do that. And where some people would hold a sped kid back because they say, well, you really need to work on learning how to read and write mm -hmm. and do these things. I'm a well, rounded person, I think I appreciate so much more and my world is full of so much more color because of those experiences. And as a coach, I think being a coach today myself and working with kids, I oftentimes, you know, work with other coaches that don't see the learning disability would happen on the field as well. And so sometimes those simple mistakes, you know, that 
I think coaching has made a shift since I was in high school where I know that I believe at Northwest where I teach and the coaches I work with, they really see coaching as teaching. And so it's really about teaching a child. And so that idea of if we're going to teach them in the classroom, working with learning disability and those strategies, let's see what strategy we can apply on the field. And that helps that child who may not succeed in school feel successful in a field and goes back to our policy. Can we show what they're great at and make them feel good about it? So no doubt you're successful. You, oh, you. I, I, I see that in you. I see your passion for impacting students. Talk about your experience at K-State and um, working through being dyslexic as a college student. It was a whole, it's a big shift and part of being dyslexic is you have to realize that the game changes all the time. The, common, the uh, coping mechanisms you use have to change when you change what you're doing. And so coming here and being in a lecture hall in Bluemont with tons of people changed the way I did it rather than being in a classroom of 25 people. But learning how to network with other people, um, learning how to get help and my success was finding the sororities who were willing to help support me with a group of people, um, finding fraternities who were willing to help work with me, and then accessing services on campus. Mm -hmm. I had uh, the ability to take tests on time. I had the ability to have a note taker. I had the ability to have a tutor through Andrew Blair and the um, services on campus, and it made a big difference. Um, and it was something I was used to hat receiving, so receiving it here helped me show who I was mm -hmm. and didn't help, didn't hold me back and allowed me to, to succeed. And I think the biggest thing is when I left K-State and why it still means so much to me is it still feels like a home because there was a family of people here, whether it was my professors or um, Pam who was the secretary in the dean's office or any of those people who cared about me and knew what I needed help with and were willing to take a few minutes to say, let me help you correct that or let me help you fix this sheet before you turn it in. Help me succeed. And today, I guess when I teach, I really try to take everything that they taught me and put it into that room. And so I hope a little bit of this experience lives on there. I'm sure there's purple there. <laughs> and I appreciate hearing that. We talk about being a family at Kansas State, and that's such a good example of it. Um, it it's not just our football team that holds that word above the huddle before they run out onto the field, but I think it really is part of the culture at, <laughs> at K-State is taking care of each other. So I'm so glad to hear that you had the services that, that helped you be successful. I and mean, yeah. that's an important part of who we are and what we want to model as a college of education. So what advice would you have um, for our pre-service teachers that have declared education is, is where they want to be in the profession that they want to impact? What, what message do you have for them? Well, you've picked the greatest job in the world uh, and the greatest profession moving forward, which is awesome. And now becomes the challenge of learning how to do it, which uh, and do it well, which is a lifelong thing. Um, good teachers are lifelong learners, and working with sped kids can be very scary and be very um, uh, overwhelming at times. And I think that idea that every sped child really wants to succeed. And if you go out as a teacher and you try to be very honest and very forthright with them. I think that a lot of sped kids are scared because when they walk in that room, they're, they're looking in the eyes of that teacher to say, will you be the one? Will you connect with me? Will you help me? And I've, the greatest advice I can tell is to be honest with that child, but also be very positive and say, you know, I, I'm glad you're in my class because I've spent a lot of time studying how to help students with learning disabilities at K-State. And I, I could take these skills and I think I can make a difference for you. And it may not be the first strategy we tried and it may not be the 12th strategy you tried, but if you stick with me, we're gonna, we're gonna make this year a success. And that success has to be seen, maybe not always an A, but we're gonna get you to where you're learning and growing and being a better person. And as a student, I would have wanted that. And I think a lot of students that I work with, when they know that you care and they know that you're willing to try those things, that's the biggest advantage you can have. Know your content, but also be willing to know those strategies because that's a powerful tool together. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Anything else you wanna share that we haven't had the opportunity to talk about yet today? No, I just, I think that um, it's a real pleasure to be back on campus and it, uh, I think that education sometimes is seen as a profession by a lot of people that um, is challenging or it's, uh, it's, it's maybe not the best people, but I think in the end, it, we as educators care a lot about kids and care a lot about them being successful and, that, and that's all children, whether they're gifted who have their own challenges or people are learning disabled, children are on a continuum rather than grade seven or grade eight or grade three. They're a continuum of learning. And if we continue to keep that in mind, that children learn at their own pace and will have leaps and bounds at some times and slow in others, I think if we look at people that way, we could see education come back to uh, the way that people viewed it, which is a success. 
Well, we have a vision at Kansas State to prepare knowledgeable, ethical, caring decision makers for a global world. Um, that, that's our vision and where we want to um, make our impact. Mm -hmm. And so I, I appreciate hearing that K-State did that for you as a student. And it's, it's very humbling to hear you talk about you making that very same type of impact with students. That's, that's what we're about is impacting lives and making a difference and being there for a student that needed, needed us at a particular point in time. So thank you for your, your work. Um, well, thank, thank you for being purple. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for giving me the opportunity and teaching me how to do it. Because I think every day when I'm in my classroom, there's a little bit of Dr. Griffin that I had an experience here with or um, uh, my teachers in high school, I sound a little bit like Mr. Bacon or I sound a little bit like Mrs. Lerner. And those people today help shape who I am as a teacher and I think help a lot of kids. So thank you, K-State, for being part of it. I appreciate it. I hear your diploma has a place of prominence. It does. It <laughs> very holds, good. It's an important thing to me. Yes, so, very thank good. You. Thank you. So thank you for being here today, thank and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.